good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Joe Antos with the American Enterprise Institute. And I want to thank uh, everyone in the room and everyone online and everyone uh, in the uh, C-SPAN audience uh, to today's uh, discussion of the Medicare Trustees Report. Uh, the the uh, Medicare Trustees issued their report yesterday, uh, and um, it uh, should not surprise anyone who's uh, here today uh, to know that uh, uh, Medicare's uh, fiscal circumstances uh, remain um, uh, a serious matter uh, for uh, the country and for taxpayers. Uh, it, it also shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that health programs are the largest category of federal spending. Uh, I think uh, this might be one of the first years where we can say that with, with absolute certainty. Uh, surpassing Social Security, Defense, and other major programs. According to the Congressional Budget Office, Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, and subsidies, uh, insurance subsidies uh, for the uh, insurance on the uh, exchanges authorized by the Affordable Care Act will account for nearly 30% of federal outlays this year. That's about uh, one and a quarter trillion dollars, uh, trillion with a T. Uh, Medicare spending is nearly $800 billion this year and will double over the next 10 years. Now, if Medicare were a private business, this would be great news for stockholders. Uh, however, it's a government program, so uh, such a large increase in spending represents a, a serious and growing uh, fiscal challenge. Uh, the Medicare trustees have repeatedly warned policymakers through their report uh, and the uh, Office of the Actuary, uh, uh, in its analyses, uh, have repeatedly warned uh, policymakers that Medicare's finances are, are fundamentally unsound, certainly over the long term, but even over the short term, there are serious, uh, serious concerns. This year is no exception. The Part A trust fund will be depleted in 2026. Uh, that means hospitals, at least in theory, in theory, that means hospitals and other providers of services covered by Part A uh, will not be paid uh, the full amount uh, determined by uh, Medicare fee schedules uh, for those services uh, beginning in 2026. And the, and the shortfall will, would, in theory, continue to grow over time. Uh, uh, the fact is, however, that uh, uh, if we got to that uh, situation, uh, or we got close to that situation, uh, policy would likely change. Uh, but would it resolve the fundamental uh, fiscal problem that Medicare faces? Um, well, so far we haven't seen some grand reform that, that I think uh, uh, the long-term perspective would say really resolves Medicare's uh, uh, financing issues. Uh, now, of course, this is the good news, that the Part A trust fund will be depleted in 2026 and the the other trust funds, there's a, a trust fund uh, for uh, Part B, which covers uh, physician and other outpatient services, and Part D, which is the drug program. Uh, and, and those uh, trust funds remain solvent indefinitely, but that's a definitional issue as opposed to uh, a, uh, uh, you know, something that, that uh, uh, should be taken as completely good news. There are two issues, uh, really, uh, related to the fact that this is not really good news. First of all, with regard to the Part A trust fund, the long-term assumptions behind the trustees' estimates are almost certainly unrealistic. Uh, the uh, Office of the Actuary produces an, an illustrative scenario. I highly recommend that for everyone. And it points out that uh, under current law, uh, there are scheduled to be very substantial reductions in payments, uh, payment rates uh, to physicians and other providers in Medicare, and those reductions are probably unsustainable. If they're unsustainable, that inevitably uh, would mean that Congress would take some action. That action would increase payment rates. Net result is that, uh, in fact, the, the shortfalls uh, are likely to be higher unless Congress were to take the bold action of increasing revenues. That last part's not very likely. Uh, that first part, it is probably likely. Um, uh, so that's, that, you know, 
raising taxes is, is very difficult to do in the best of circumstances. Raising taxes uh, uh, on seniors is very difficult to do. Raising taxes on a general uh, population is very difficult to do, even if it is to uh, uh, buttress the uh, Medicare program, which everyone has a very high regard for, uh, but nonetheless paying for it's another entirely different matter. Um, so it's not politically sustainable. Uh, and uh, if we have a situation where, uh, in fact, these cuts were to continue as scheduled, uh, we would see serious reductions in, in payments. For example, uh, the uh, illustrative uh, scenario points out that uh, physician payment would drop to 54% of, of um, what uh, private insurance pays on average around 2033. In other words, about uh, 15 years from now. Uh, and that's the Medicaid level, and they would continue to drop. Uh, that's, not, that's not politically sustainable, and it threatens access to care for seniors. One other fact that's kind of worth uh, noting, and, and uh, this is kind of a call out to the trustees' report. There's, it's a very long report, and there's some very interesting tables, and you have to dig, it, dig through them to, to uh, see uh, some, some very interesting points. But, but one of the points that I found particularly interesting was to look at uh, who's actually going to end up uh, paying the bill, at least if uh, current law uh, you know, works its way through for 75 years or, or indefinitely. So uh, uh, we have uh, Part A, interestingly enough, Part A uh, has uh, a, a, a positive balance in terms of obligations that are funded through what's called the infinite horizon. That's, those are the numbers I happen to look at. Um, what that means is that um, uh, according to current law, which includes these unrealistic reductions in payment rates, um, that uh, part, uh, part A will, in, in essence, be in, in good shape uh, indefinitely. Over the, uh, over the infinite horizon, in present value terms, uh, uh, Part A would uh, 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 produce uh, $3.9 trillion in savings. Uh, this, of course, is remember, this is uh, uh, an actuarial estimate. It's based on unrealistic assumptions that are required because of current law. But there, this is also not money in your pockets. We're not going to see $3.9 trillion uh, in Part A um, uh, next year, for example. But what about Part B and Part D? These are programs that are, whose trust funds can never become um, uh, uh, insolvent. Uh, and yet, uh, if you look at the obligations that are not paid for directly by payments and premiums or, or dedicated revenues, they're paid for through general revenues, what do you see? Well, you see that in Part B, and, uh, $61 trillion uh, is paid for through general revenues, Part D, $23 trillion. In other words, the shortfall, um, if things were to continue the way uh, current law says, is about $80 trillion. That's a huge shortfall. Now, we're not gonna be able to make that up anytime soon. That's not a realistic number in terms of day-to-day -day policy or year-to-year -year policy, but it does illustrate the, the size of the problem in a way that should attract attention um, uh, and, and might attract uh, some serious attention uh, from policymakers uh, as we get closer to the point where uh, these cuts are uh, no longer uh, politically sustainable. But I raise this to uh, also make the point about who would pay this amount of money. And it turns out that uh, it's not the baby boomers, or at least it's not the older baby boomers. I'm one of the older baby boomers. And so uh, in Part A in particular, what do we see? That, that current participants, um, uh, that the trust fund balance for current participants is about $13 trillion. It's to the good, $13 trillion to the good. So that includes everybody who's over 65 today who's in the Medicare program and disabled people who are uh, enrolled in Medicare. Um, uh, what about future participants? That would be people who enroll uh, after today. Well, the answer is that their balance is negative. Uh, it's uh, negative uh, $17 trillion. So the numbers are uh, big numbers. They're hard to understand, but the point is clear that this is a huge transfer of resources 
from the younger generation to the older generation. Uh, and interestingly, the younger generation is now uh, beginning to enter Congress, so they have a chance to do something. As a member of the older generation, I could be a little concerned about that. Um, well, in any event, uh, enough editorialization. Uh, let me introduce the panel. Uh, and uh, we're going to start uh, with uh, a presentation by Paul Spitalnik, who is the chief actuary for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, Paul is uh, an associate of the Society of Actuaries, and he's a member of the American Academy of Actuaries. Uh, then we have the panel. Uh, and so the uh, first speaker on the, sp speaker, speaker on the panel is uh, Bob Moffat. He's a senior fellow with the Heritage Foundation. Uh, he uh, recently stepped down as chairman of the uh, Maryland Health Care Commission. Uh, and uh, yeah, long ago, he was uh, deputy assistant secretary uh, in HHS, and he was a senior official at the Office of Personnel Management. He's going to be uh, addressing more specifically the fiscal challenges facing the program. Uh, uh, next, we have uh, Tara O'Neill Hayes. Uh, she is the Deputy Director of Healthcare Policy at the American Action Forum. Uh, in previous uh, uh, years, she uh, worked on the Hill in various positions, and uh, she's uh, written some uh, uh, great papers about uh, Part D, in particular the structure of Part D, and I think she'll be uh, largely addressing those issues, uh, which um, uh, could, could actually be addressed, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the next few years. Uh, that's a distinct possibility. There's a lot of talk about uh, the cost of uh, pharmaceutical drugs. The Medicare program is a big factor. It's a big purchaser of uh, drugs or a big payer for drugs. And Medicare policies really drive a lot of what goes on in, in uh, pricing in that sector. And then finally, we'll end up with uh, Corey Uccello, who is an actuary and senior health, senior health fellow at the uh, American Academy of Actuaries. Uh, uh, she served two terms as a commissioner on uh, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. She was a member of the uh, technical review panel uh, for the Medicare Trustees Report a few years ago, and she's uh, currently a member of CBO's panel of health advisors. Uh, Corey's going to uh, look at the, one of the other big issues that uh, is at least on the minds of uh, some political folks, and that is, uh, well, what about a Medicare buy-in? Or what about, maybe, what about Medicare for all, but probably Medicare buy-in? What could that possibly mean in terms of impact on the long-term fiscal future uh, of the program? And so with that, uh, Paul, uh, please join us. Good morning. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'd like to start off by just mentioning that I um, uh, appreciate Joe's introductory remarks, um, as well as the uh, title of this uh, uh, presentation today of Medicare's Perilous Financial Future. I will note that those were Joe's editorializing um, and interpretation, and in no way represents the position of the Office of the Actuary or the Medicare trustees. Uh, but it is my pleasure to um, speak with you today about um, the 2019 Medicare Trustees Report that was released yesterday. Um, I'm going to be talking through the um, current snapshot and evolution of the program, as well as uh, the formal evaluation that occurs uh, within the Trustees Reports each year. Um, for those that have uh, seen me do this talk before, you know that um, a lot of the uh, 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 themes in the presentation and throughout the report are recurring. And so I do try to introduce a couple of new topics each year. Um, last year I introduced um, how have the projections changed over the last five years. Um, and this year we've, uh, I've uh, split out a little bit about uh, how price and some of the other contributions are affecting the projections to put things in a little more context. Um, but to start through, um, this is what the program, um, how the program is, is constructed. Uh, Joe alluded to this in his introductory remarks. Um, there are two different uh, trust funds for the Medicare program. The HI, or Hospital Insurance Trust Fund, uh, provides Part A services. Uh, this is predominantly inpatient care, uh, institutional settings, and, and the like. Um, when the discussion turns to um, Medicare is going to go bankrupt, or something along those lines, uh, people are generally referring to the Part A trust fund. Um, 
Part A provides benefits uh, to 59 uh, million people um, in 2018. Um, and it, this is financed uh, through payroll taxes. So those that are working and their employers each contribute 1.45%. Um, in addition, uh, individuals that make over 200,000 or um, couples that make over 250,000 contribute an additional 0.9% of uh, their payroll. Um, the other trust fund is the Supplementary Medical Insurance, SMI, uh, which, provide, which has two different accounts in it. The Part B account provides Part B services. Um, these are um, other services, uh, that non-institutional services, things like physician, things like um, durable medical equipment, um, uh, home health services that are not provided after an institutional care, um, and a number of other services as well. Uh, you can see that this is a voluntary program. People are contributing uh, uh, premiums into the program that, that choose to enroll. And as you can see, the vast majority of enrollees do choose to enroll in the program. Um, the premium in 2019 is $135.50. And we'll talk a little bit about that in uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, similarly, uh, the, the, the balance of the financing is generally through uh, general revenue transfers. And this is uh, the, the large, uh, scary numbers that Joe was alluding to earlier. Um, when you look at uh, a present value of those uh, you know, general revenue transfers, uh, you do get to very large m numbers, especially when you're looking out over a very long period of time. Uh, the other account within the uh, SMI trust fund is Part D. This provides prescription drug uh, coverage. Um, again, this is also voluntary, and uh, you can see also a large number of uh, eligible beneficiaries do choose to enroll here. Um, similarly, the financing is split between uh, a little bit more than 25.5% of the basic benefit is financed through uh, beneficiary premiums. The balance is also uh, financed through general revenue transfers. Um, so in addition, there's a little bit of uh, state clawback amounts as well. This uh, slide compares how the um, program has changed over time. You can see that uh, 40 years ago, the program was predominantly a hospital program. Um, and over time, you look uh, 20 years ago, uh, the, the pie chart fills in some, and uh, there's uh, some additional services that are being provided. Um, and if you look uh, last year, uh, there's a number of different categories that are included in here, um, and some that weren't even envisioned in um, you know, 40 years ago in the program. Um, of particular note, you know, the large uh, and growing share of uh, managed care um, has uh, significantly affected the program over the recent years. We'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, I'd like to show this slide um, to kind of give context before I talk about a 75-year projection. Um, if we were looking 40 years ago, uh, there would be virtually no way to accurately forecast um, exactly how that pie would be constructed 40 years from now. Um, a number of changes to the program, uh, legislative uh, and, and other, um, have affected how the program has evolved over time. I suspect uh, 40 years from now, the distribution of uh, Medicare expenditures will look somewhat uh, different than uh, represented here as well. However, the trustees are charged with uh, coming up with 75-year uh, estimates, and so we, um, I, I will take issue with one of uh, words Joe's, uh, that Joe alluded to, um, in that there's unreasonable assumptions. I think the assumptions are perfectly reasonable. Um, the, the, we call into question and whether or not uh, some aspects of current law uh, can be achieved indefinitely into the future. And so just to parse a little bit of words with Joe there. So the, again, grounded in, um, as reasonable assumptions as can be made uh, with the constraint of looking at what uh, the requirements under current law is, um, that is effectively what the charge of the trustees are um, in evaluating the financial status. Um, here you can look at uh, the 2018 uh, Medicare experience. This is on a cash basis. Uh, most of their analysis is on an incurred basis, which is uh, slightly different than what you see here. Um, uh, largely, you could see that uh, the uh, the experience was actually pretty close to what was projected. Um, you can see the HI income uh, expenditures uh, you know, were within a, a couple of tens of percent of what was estimated. Um, SMI expenditures as well. Um, on an incurred basis, actually, these signs do flip a little bit, um, which 
uh, we could talk a little bit about uh, as we go through the presentation. And actually, here it is. Um, the, the actual incurred experience, uh, again, just slightly different from what was shown on the previous slide, uh, but does show that expenditures were a little bit higher than, expended, uh, than expected um, for both HI and SMI. This chart uh, shows uh, the overall financing of the Medicare program um, through the different components. Um, what was originally, um, and for, the, for most of the history of the program, was the largest component was the payroll taxes, which is what's on the bottom. Um, starting in 2009, uh, that uh, large blue uh, shade in, in the middle, uh, the general revenue transfers, that actually has taken over and is the, has been the largest uh, share of Medicare financing since 2009. What also gets a fair amount of attention is that uh, orange deficit that's at the top, and we'll spend a little bit more time talking about that later on in the presentation, uh, but that is what gets uh, a fair amount of attention when the report comes out, that the uh, HI trust fund is projected to be depleted. This year it's projected to be depleted in 2026. Um, that deficit re reflects um, expenditures that are effectively um, promised under current law that there's not uh, currently adequate financing to actually provide. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the evaluation of the, uh, the, the trust funds, uh, given that the trust funds are established uh, very differently and the financing of the programs are, are very different, um, the programs must be evaluated very differently. Um, so when we look at the HI program, um, are the assets plus projected income adequate to uh, finance the anticip anticipated benefit costs? On SMI, given that the financing is established on an annual basis, um, there's not a question of whether or not the uh, program is financially um, in balance. The question is, is um, are the resources that are being provided to these benefits appropriate, um, you know, both from a federal fiscal, fiscal perspective as well as um, you know, beneficiaries' costs and their out-of-pockets. So this is the uh, doom and gloom chart. Uh, this shows uh, how the HI, the hospital insurance uh, part of the trust fund, is expected to perform. You could see that, um, generally speaking, the assets are uh, projected to go down. Um, 2018, there was an actuarial deficit. Uh, you know, I sh should have mentioned that in the earlier slide. Um, effectively, expenditures were greater than uh, the income that came in, so there was a drawdown on the assets. Um, that uh, deficit is expected to remain throughout the, uh, the balance of the projection period. Um, as a result, the assets are um, going down, and they are projected to get depleted um, this year in 2026, which is the same year as projected last year. You can see in this chart, it's uh, a little bit sooner in 2026. We tend to not make, uh, uh, pay much attention to, um, you know, timing within a particular year, particularly when we're a number of years out. But uh, yes, as we'll talk about uh, when we get to the actuarial deficit, you can see that the uh, status slightly worsened. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, we talk about uh, depletion dates in terms of years, as, and the year was unchanged in 2026. So there's a number of factors. Um, so that, that previous story wasn't all, all that exciting. Not a lot happened. Um, what actually happened was only slightly more exciting. Um, so there was a little lower uh, lev revenue that was uh, projected. Um, so we got a little less in payroll taxes and a little less uh, income from taxation uh, from Social Security benefits. And expenditures were, again, slightly higher than what was expected. Um, the higher expected, uh, you know, there was a slightly higher uh, provider payment updates. Um, there was also uh, factors that led to lower expenditures. Um, in particular, we lowered the uh, skilled nursing facility utilization assumptions. So this is the actuarial balance. This is um, a way to represent uh, the actual financing of the program, uh, the financing of the Part A program um, into a uh, percentage term, and this is uh, basically looks at all of the projected income, all of the projected uh, costs as a share of taxable payroll. Um, so the current uh, income rate is that 1.45% that's paid for by both uh, uh, individuals and their employers, 
plus the additional tax on benefits, plus the additional um, uh, payroll tax for the high income earners that I, that I mentioned. And you can see that gets you up to this 3.97%. Um, the cost rate is measured as all the projected costs uh, for the program uh, on a present value basis. Uh, divided by the present value of the taxable payroll, and we get the 4.88%. So this actuarial balance, the difference between the income and the cost rate, reflects what the uh, effectively what the actuarial deficit is. Um, this uh, 0.91 um, negative actuarial balance means there is a deficit in the program. And effectively what that means is that in order to address this deficit, um, one way to address this deficit would be to immediately increase the income rate by this 0.091%. So instead of uh, employers and employees uh, combined paying 2.9%, um, we could change the payroll tax, as Joe alluded to. Raising taxes is never easy, and uh, he editorialized around that. Uh, but one way to address this actuarial deficit would be to change the payroll tax from the 2.9% up to uh, 3. Um, 2.9 to 3.881%. Uh, we'll also talk about, so here, here's the, the components of how that changed. So there's a number of factors that uh, uh, go into a projection uh, like this. Um, just moving the valuation period, so replacing a relatively low cost year um, in the early part of the period with a high cost year in the end of the, the projection um, generally has a negative effect on the balance. On the base estimate, so the fact that experience in 2018 on an incurred basis was a little worse than expected, um, brought things down some. Um, not a lot happening around the managed care space and the private health care assumptions. Um, but in the other provider assumptions and the other uh, economic and demographic assumptions, um, that's where there was a fair amount of action. On the uh, other provider assumptions, I mentioned earlier, we lowered the projected SNF utilization. Um, that had a um, improvement of the actuarial balance by this 0.1%. There was also a uh, change in the long range uh, assumption for uh, productivity. So uh, most non-physician provider uh, up payment rate updates are increased by um, underlying economic indicators, so something like a market basket and the like. Um, that is then reduced by the level of economy-wide uh, non-farm labor productivity. Um, the assumption in this year's report for both the Medicare and for the Social Security report um, had a lowering of the uh, productivity assumptions. Lowering the productivity assumptions, something that um, is used to reduce the payment rate updates, smaller reduction means the payment rates are increasing at a higher rate. Um, and so that actually had a uh, significant increase in uh, a worsening of the actuarial deficit in response to that change. And so that was the bulk of this uh, other economic and demographic assumptions, about 0.1% uh, percent of that it was attributable to that change in the productivity assumptions. And that's uh, effectively the walkthrough from the 0.82 to the 0.91 in terms of actuarial deficit. So this... Uh, is just a comparison of how the income and cost rates uh, change over time. Um, you could see that uh, the income rate is you know, it's generally upward sloping, and that's because those um, additional 0.9% uh, uh, values that I mentioned before, about the 200,000 per um, additional 0.9% for high income earners, those making more than 200,000 individual or 250,000 for a couple, um, those amounts are not indexed. And so over time, the expectation is that more and more individuals will be paying those um, higher uh, payroll tax amounts. You can also see that in 2026, the line drops down from the cost rate uh, to the income rate. And effectively, that reflects that the gap between uh, those two lines at that point reflects that actuarial deficit that would need to be um, funded in order to uh, fully pay all of the costs on time. You can see that when the uh, trust fund is depleted in 2026, the payments don't go to zero. There's still uh, a significant amount of income coming into the program. Uh, you can see that in 2026, the ratio between the um, income rate um, and the cost rate, the amount of benefits that would still be able to be financed, is 89%. Um, 
that amount changes somewhat over time, but generally hovers in this, uh, you, know, be, you know, between the high 70s and low 80s percent um, over time. And effectively, that means that all this income's coming in, we'll be able to pay almost 80%, uh, you know, roughly, um, of the benefits at becoming due at that time. So effectively, we would need to either increase the income rate by, um, by the 0.91% that I mentioned earlier, or we could reduce uh, benefit payments by 19% immediately, and that would address this, uh, this deficit. Um, you can see here that there was not a lot of change from last year's report, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, as Joe mentioned in his introductory remarks, that uh, the Office of the Actuary produces an illustrative alternative scenario. Um, there are uh, a couple of provisions in, in current law that are that, that may be problematic in the long range. Um, the two that are cited um, are, one, the productivity cuts. So these are those productivity cuts that I mentioned um, earlier, um, that the payment rate updates for most non-physicians are updated, are reduced uh, by economy-wide productivity. Um, all the analysis that we've done um, suggests that uh, in the health sector, uh, they will not be able to keep up with those levels of productivity, given that the health sector is, is so labor-intensive. And so to the extent that uh, payment rate updates are being reduced by economy-wide productivity, which in this year's report is assumed to be about 1% in the long range, um, but achievable um, health sector productivity is closer to 0.4%, that 0.6% wedge, which is not very big um, when you look at any one particular year, but when you accumulate that 0.6% over 75 years, um, that gets to a, be a very large uh, a, a large reduction. Similarly, and even more dramatically, um, the physician updates are specified in, in law um, to be particular levels, um, particularly 0 0.75 for those that are produ uh, participating in advanced APMs, um, or 0 0.25 for all others that are participating in the MIPS programs. That's the update for uh, physicians uh, starting in 2026 and, and every year thereafter, uh, to the extent that actual uh, costs for running a uh, physician office um, exceed that, that would be uh, basically a, a gap that would have to be funded uh, by other uh, sources. And so you would have cost shifting or you have uh, potentially uh, uh, impacts on quality of services. And so that gap between what we think um, actual uh, physician cost increase uh, in the MEI, which is assumed in this year to be 2.25%, and this either 0.25 or 0.75%, those accumulate um, similarly as uh, the productivity offsets, um, but they do so at a much larger level um, and at a much quicker level. So, um, so in response to these uh, two, uh, two uh, issues or potential issues with current law, uh, we calculate in the Office of the Actuary, and the, it is referenced in many places in the report, the effects of the illustrative alternative. And effectively, that assumes that these productivity cuts uh, are transitioned to um, what would be achievable under the health sector. I think gets there in 2042, so it's a relatively slow transition. So a lot of um, those price reductions can still uh, be implemented. And similarly, the physician uh, updates are transitioned to the MEI over time. And so when you look at the effects of the um, illustrative alternative, you can see that that has a dramatic effect on the long-range HI financing. Um, instead of that cost line basically flattening out to a large degree, um, it would be projected to continue to increase. We'll, we'll see a similar chart when we look at uh, Part B as well. So here's the Part B cash income and outgo, and you can see these are relatively close uh, to what was projected in, in last year's report. Um, similar on the Part D side, uh, the projections in Part D were actually a little bit lower than in last year's report. We'll talk about that in a moment. But you can see here that the 2018 experience was relatively close. Um, the long range on Part B 
um, is considerably higher in this year's report than it was in last year's report. The main uh, issue there is there's actually two, two issues. Uh, one is the productivity change. So I mentioned earlier in explaining the HI differences that the reduction in the assumption for long-range productivity had a negative effect on the HI actuarial balance. It similarly had a negative effect on affecting the uh, projected Part B costs. And so there was an increase in Part B costs associated with that as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also on the Part B side, um, we've done some uh, s uh, specific modeling with respect to physician-administered drugs. Um, so we've broken that out and been able to model that separately. Um, there has been uh, higher trends associated with those phys physician-administered drugs over recent past um, and, and projected into the future. And uh, uh, that refinement in the modeling has um, also had an uh, effect of increasing the long-range uh, Part B projections. On the Part D side, um, not much to talk about in the short range, but in the long range, um, there was a slight improvement, and there was a continuing expectation for even higher uh, manufacturer rebates, um, as well as a slightly slower trend than what was assumed in last year's report. I this is probably a good time to mention that uh, the report is done on a current law and current services basis. So the um, some of the proposals, uh, some of the rules that have been uh, uh, promulgated that ha are were in proposed form um, that have not yet been finalized have not been incorporated into this report. This is just a current law, current services, um, effectively current state projection. To the extent that some of those uh, rules would get finalized, um, there would certainly be effects um, for the programs. And so this shows that that illustrative alternative has a significant effect, um, you know, both for Part A, um, for, for all of the parts, not just for Part, um, for part A. Um, you can see that at the, you know, we are currently in 2018, uh, Medicare was 3.7% of GDP. It is projected under current law uh, to get to 6.5% at the end of the 75 year projection period. The effects of those, you know, small 0.6s or even larger on the physician side, um, add up pretty significantly, and they would get up to, um, the, in, instead of 6.5% at the end of the short range, uh, end of the long range period under current law, under the illustrative alternative that transitions out, um, you know, some of those price reductions, um, the share GDP jumps all the way up to 9%. So take a look at how these projections have changed over the last five years. Um, it's on HI, it's going to be largely a, uh, an income story. Um, so taxable payroll uh, was, has been significantly slower than what was assumed in last year's report, uh, in the report five years ago. Um, that's partly, almost predominantly, due to um, a slower economic recovery than was assumed in, in those uh, you know, older reports. Um, there was also some slight effects of, or some effects from the... Uh, the tax law that uh, actually reduced some of the tax on income that was coming into the trust funds. Um, so that also negatively affect the income. So the taxable payroll um, is, is this effect, um, and that leads to the lower income, as you see here. Um, in terms of expenditures, they're not materially different. They're, obviously, there's um, new policies that are incorporated, um, the new assumptions. Um, but overall, there was not a, there's not a huge story here on the HI expenditure side in terms of differences from what was projected. Um, the trust fund ratio, um, in particular, less income coming in, uh, assets aren't going to go as far. Uh, and so the uh, trust fund depletion date is, has been earlier than was assumed uh, five years ago. On the SMI side, uh, Costs were slightly higher than what was projected five years ago. All things considered, this is not a, a huge a huge difference here. On the D side, um, expenditures were are pretty sizably lower than what was projected. Um, this is largely due to um, the effects of even more uh, manufacturer rebates, uh, reducing the cost of the program, um, certainly more so than what was assumed in the earlier projections. 
And one area where I can completely admit that uh, we, the Office of the Actuary, and unfortunately, therefore, the trustees, um, missed um, is with the uh, continued increase in uh, private health plan enrollments. Um, five years ago, we thought that uh, there would be a, uh, a leveling off of uh, the enrollment in response to some of the payment reductions that were implemented as part of the Affordable Care Act. Turns out actual enrollment kept continuing inc to, to increase um, as a share. Um, and uh, as you can see, there, uh, the current expectation is that uh, there will be even more growth in, in managed care enrollment. So in thinking about uh, these comparisons that I made, um, I made similar comparisons last year, one of, <laughs> and in response to uh, some of the, there's been more criticisms um, of some of the work that OACT has done um, and so I generally don't get defensive, and I, 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 it's, I, I don't feel comfortable getting defensive. And so I wanted to kind of just share some of the information about uh, how these projections are done um, and what's kind of underlying these. Um, there's been some, uh, like I said, criticism that we have uh, continuously been overestimating uh, what these costs have been, and certainly you look at the last five years, um, it's, it's fairly, it, it, it's, not unreasonable to say that we overestimated at least some aspects of the uh, cost of the program. But we wanted to break things down a little bit. And so how has, um, how are our projections, how do we construct our projections relative to the history? And kind of what's the basis of these? And so this is looking at uh, Part A. And so you can see that uh, Part A increases and in, was it the red line is the price updates, the blue line are the non-price increases. We turned things into per capita. Um, generally speaking, we've done a pretty good job about modeling the um, effects of enrollment. And so one of the look things, you know, what really drives the projections is the per capita trends. And so breaking down these per capita trends between price and non-price factors is a useful measure for um, both actually doing the projections, but also to kind of evaluate what's underlying these projections. And so you can see there's a whole bunch of noise here, but if we actually break it down by the pieces, you can see that the price effects um, are relatively stable. You can see that we had a period there where we had um, really low price updates, and that was uh, somewhat after the, um, the, the Affordable Care Act. Um, there were some, uh, some relatively low prices. Um, there's an expectation in, in the future that uh, economic activity will uh, increase somewhat um, and some of the reductions that have been uh, in, in the history will, will not repeat itself. Um, and so you can see that there's not a, a huge uh, change in the uh, price updates. Um, one thing that stands out at the end of the period, um, you can see the effect of uh, the removal of the sequester. So the removal of the sequester is expected to be in that, that last year there. You can see in, in some of those earlier periods, in you know, the period uh, 2012, 2013, um, you can see the effects of the sequester even bringing down those relatively low lines even lower. But where is, there's even more interesting pattern is here's the um, non-price factors, uh, both in the history and um, in the projections. And we could probably spend an entire uh, session just talking about the history and what's happening here. You could see the effects of uh, something like uh, the uh, SNF and Home Health uh, uh, prospective payment system in the late 90s, um, you know, through 2000, really big drop there. You could see some bounce backs off of some of those levels. Um, you could see the effects around uh, in the 2010, 2012 area. Um, of uh, additional rack activity that was uh, uh, really affecting uh, some of the short stay hospitalizations. Um, but I'll turn your attention more to the projection period and say, well, we're assuming that we're going to get about, you know, we've, for, if you look over the last you know, decade or so, we've had zero to negative trend in these non price factors. Some of that's demographic, um, you know, influx of new. Uh, younger, healthier, uh, baby boom bit generation. Um, that's not going to continue indefinitely. Uh, but, but there has been this unusual period. Uh, some people have described this as the new normal. Um, and I think most, uh, where most of the criticism that we've received has been around, well, 
why aren't we just assuming that new normal will continue out indefinitely? Well, if you look at the history, um, that new normal truly does stand out as the exception. You know, unless you have these major policy shocks, um, generally there has been upward pressure here. Now, when we look at those projections, we don't go to a very high level of utilization increases. It's pretty modest. We're you know, roughly in that 1% range. Um, is it going to be right? I, I can't tell you it's going to be right. I can tell you as an actuary, I'm hopeful that it's as likely to be a little bit higher or a little bit lower than the number here um, as we can make it. Um, but th that's looking at the Part A story. Um, and one thing I note before moving on to Part B, which even has even a little more interesting pattern, is that you'll see that last period um, before we shift from historical to projected, there's a slight increase there. Now, one point doesn't make a long trend. It might make a trend, um, but it's certainly not a reliable trend. Um, but the, at least there has been um, some uh, experience that has suggested that um, costs or, or the non-price piece of spending has increased, at least modestly, on a per capita basis. Um, here's a similar chart on Part B. Um, and again, we do break it down between the price and non-price components. You can see the price components. Um, there's similar policy-related stories around a lot of the, the, the noise here. but. See, there's not a huge price story, certainly not in the projection. Again, the sequester affects the, the tail end there. Um, but here's the utilization story. And yes, there's been a steady de decrease from those extraordinarily high amounts um, you know, in the, the early 2000s. Um, but once again, I'll point out that that last um, uh, point on the cusp between historical and projected, um, that's actual experience. That's what actual 2018 looked like on a per capita basis. So there's a number of policy um, interventions that have affected uh, you know, spending over the last decade or so. There's uh, universal acknowledgement that trends have been relatively low um, over this past decade. Um, for purposes of doing these projections, other projections, the projections that CBO and others might do, um, it's really important to kind of Look at you know, take that look forward, um, and what is what are those projected trends looking like looking forward? And again, we have an increase from you know that hit that that those historically low levels of the last decade, um, but considerably lower than uh, some of those uh, you know most of that that higher experience experienced uh, in the decade prior to that, and even lower than the experience that we experienced in 2018. So whether this is the Best projection, or um, a uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say this. Uh, th these projections can't be criticized by all means. I think most are comfortable doing so. Um, but in terms of whether or not uh, they are going to be, you know, the actual projection, you know, the actual trends are going to be higher or lower than these. Um, looking at this chart, I'm not sure. There could be a consensus around, you know, these are too high or these are too low, and I think that's the right place for, that's a comfortable place for an actuary to be. I think that's the end of my proje projection. I thank you for your time. I look forward to hearing the discussion. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, so not sure is the best position. I, you know, economists and actuaries have a lot in common. Uh, Bob? Yes, well, political scientists don't have much in common with most anybody. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to uh, do, I, I mean, very frankly, um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we owe the Office of the Actuary a great deal of thanks. Uh, the annual Medicare trustees report is literally a treasure trove of outstanding uh, detailed information. Uh, it reflects a tremendous amount of hard work. And it's useful uh, for a wide variety of, uh, of a wide variety of areas of, of health policy. Uh, not only uh, you know not only the projections on the future of Medicare, but also the comparisons between Medicare and private spending, or private private health insurance, and so on. So, once again, uh, Paul, uh, thank you for a terrific presentation. Um, I guess the big story this year is it's. Uh, 
Deja vu all over again, right? Uh, this does not look very much different than the uh, report of 2018. Uh, what that means is, is that from the standpoint of the overall financial condition of the Medicare program, there has been no significant improvement. Um, the 2019 report says, in effect, uh, uh, repeats a common theme, uh, that Medicare does not meet the trustee's standards for financial adequacy in either the short term uh, or the long term. There's no surprise here, really. Uh, they said this last year. Uh, they've repeated this declaration, as far as I can recall, for many, many years. Uh, last year, the Medicare fiscal challenges have been quite apparent. If you'll remember, the press reporting on the, on the, uh, in the, on the 2018 report was uh, reflecting some urgency, uh, that Medicare's situation was not as good as people had thought. It was actually worse. Um, in 2018, the trustees reported that spending for the Medicare hospitalization uh, trust fund was going to continue uh, to exceed its income, and the annual deficits would grow larger each year until the trust fund is insolvent in 2026. Uh, that's the same message we have this year. Um, this year, the trustees also issue another warning. If you look at the, toward the beginning of the report, they repeat what they have repeated for many, many years. The overall financial condition of Medicare requires that the president and the Congress get together and take this seriously and they argue uh, again that the Congress and the President should take urgent action, that the sooner they address the financial conditions of Medicare, the better. Uh, they have issued these warnings routinely for many years, and the bad news is obviously to no avail. Uh, the trustees report that the trust fund condition is, as I said, as bad as it was last year, uh, in 2018, the Medicare trustees reported that the part tr a trust fund was going to be insolvent in 2026. And if you recall, uh, that was uh, three years earlier than they had previously projected. Uh, insolvency in this context uh, means that the hospitalization trust fund is not going to be able to pay all of its bills. Um, I hasten to add uh, on this, and I, I, I have to make this point because uh, oftentimes we hear in the media a lot of language that's thrown around that is somewhat inaccurate. Uh, we hear the term bankruptcy uh, you, uh, referring to the insolvency. In popular understanding, the term bankruptcy uh, means some kind of collapse. It's an unfortunate exaggeration of the truth of the Medicare situation. It frightens a lot of people. The reality is that in the Medicare uh, context, uh, Bankruptcy and is here, this is not bankruptcy in the private sector sense. The program is not going to go under. It is not going to collapse. It's simply not going to be able to pay for all of the promised benefits. 89% uh, uh, of the uh, promised benefits uh, will be paid when the program becomes insolvent in 2026. Um, they have always, by the way, I mean, as long as I can remember, the trustees projected insolvency just as a historical note 2019, this is the year that the trust fund was supposed to be insolvent based on the 2007 uh, Medicare trustees report. Um, the White House and the Congress uh, have ignored uh, the Medicare trigger warning. Uh, I think this is an important point. Just as a, as a political scientist, I must say, uh, one of the things I'm concerned about is the preservation of authority and when the authority of the law is undermined, uh, that undermines the respect for the law. Last year, the Medicare trustees projected that the general revenues would grow as a share of Medicare's total financing um, from 2018 to 2032 and would account for 49% of the Medicare's total cost. You'll recall that Congress made it very clear that they wanted to draw attention back in 2003 to the growing demand of the program on general revenues. And they uh, decided that if the general revenues exceeded 45% uh, of the total cost, they should issue a funding warning. The trustees should issue a funding warning whenever that happened. Uh, they did so last year, and again in 2019, they've issued a second funding warning. Uh, they project 
that the general revenues will exceed uh, the 45% threshold in 2021. Um, for this year, the president was legally obligated to submit legislation to the uh, Capitol Hill within 15 days of submitting the presidential budget uh, to address the spending problem. The president uh, did not submit any separate legislation uh, in, to comply with the warning. I will say, however, and it must be said to his credit that the president did submit a legislative package of about 36 specific proposals as part of his 2020 budget. Uh, the items range from uh, improvements in value-based uh, payment systems, um, items to promote competition and reduce regulatory and paperwork burdens in Medicare, uh, to improve Medicare's uh, rather complex uh, an overburdened appeal system. Altogether, these legislative proposals would yield uh, savings of $811 billion over a 10-year period. And uh, the uh, Office of Management and Budget uh, estimates that it would extend the trust fund by eight years. Um, I would say that uh, most of these items are plain common sense, uh, such as the expansion of site neutrality and Medicare payment, uh, paying doctors for a procedure in a hospital the same as they would pay for a procedure in a doctor's office, uh, a change that would, I think, uh, stimulate competition on the ground and reverse the trend toward consolidation in hospital and healthcare delivery uh, systems. A very, very good idea. The big issue in uh, this area is not the hospitalization trust fund. It is the uh, growth of Medicare spending. Uh, with the exception of Social Security, uh, Medicare is the largest and fastest growing of all the federal entitlements. The trustees tell us this year that Medicare, uh, Medicare costs uh, amount to about 76% of Social Security in 2019. Uh, by 2040, the total Medicare costs will exceed the total cost of Social Security. Medicare is going to grow faster than wages, general inflation in the economy. Uh, the trustees now say that the Medicare will grow, the Medicare program will grow from 3.7% uh, of GDP in 2018 to 5.9% by 2038. Uh, <clears throat> the CBO has also uh, made uh, estimates of rapid growth in Medicare, and they say this is basically for two reasons. One, of course, is the tremendous growth in, in enrollment that we're gonna see over the next 15 years among the baby boomers. And the second point, of course, is that uh, with, medical, uh, with medical care becoming increasingly sophisticated over time, we're gonna see greater uh, use of uh, more sophisticated medical technology, the per capita cost of care for caring for a larger uh, number of uh, aged and disabled population uh, will, will start to grow. Uh, Medicare's dependence uh, on growing dependence on general revenues, uh, the federal income and business taxes, is, as Joe Antos properly pointed out, a major fiscal challenge and a deepening problem for the nation's uh, taxpayers. Uh, over the next 75 years, it's a big, scary number, as Paul points out, but nevertheless, it is a real indication of the financial burdens facing the American people. The American taxpayers are going to, uh, going to face progressively larger burdens filling the gap, uh, the unfunded obligations of the program, what we have promised senior citizens in terms of the benefits and what we are going to be required to pay to fulfill those promises. And we're talking about tens of trillions of dollars, a very, very large number. Um, well, the trustees have said repeatedly year after year, right, that Congress and the White House should get together and start to get serious about this issue. The policymakers in Washington need to wake up. Uh, we have been analyzing this. We have been bickering. We have debating and discussing Medicare uh, for as long as I remember, for decades. Uh, since the 1980s, we have made some changes. We've made changes in payment systems which have a mixed, I emphasize the word mixed, record of success. Uh, we've made some structural changes in Medicare, specifically Medicare Advantage and Medicare Part D, 
which do seem to provide some very serious uh, progress in this area, have been beneficial both to taxpayers and beneficiaries. Uh, the Medicare trustees have been telling us again and again that we should address the problems of the program sooner than later. Um, I would just mention three things. I, I can't leave this without talking about what we should do. Uh, as the trustees point out, there are a lot of policy options open uh, in this area. Uh, I will just mention three of them, which are very, very old recommendations, but they are still very valid. One is to combine Medicare Part A and Part B into a single program, um, reform the cost-sharing system, uh, make it much more rational. As all of you know who've been following this, the existing cost-sharing arrangements are driving costs up in Medicare unnecessarily and provide senior citizens with catastrophic coverage, some um, a, a benefit that will give them peace of mind. The greatest single weakness in the benefit structure of the traditional Medicare program is the absence of the fundamental principle of insurance, which is protection against catastrophic illness. I mean, frankly, ladies and gentlemen, it is absurd that we're actually having this conversation in the 21st century. This should have been done a long time ago. I would also argue that uh, we have to reduce the taxpayer subsidies to um, upper income uh, seniors. We've done this already to some extent in a modest way. Uh, we actually have to uh, go further in this area, it seems to me. Uh, we cannot have an entitlement program where we end up uh, financing uh, people in retirement, uh, you know, where you have this massive transfer of people for working people, middle income people to support very wealthy retirees. I'm not suggesting that we do away with this entirely, but what I am saying is, is that we have to make uh, the next generation of retirees who are wealthy uh, pay more for their benefits. And finally, we should raise the age of eligibility, uh, normal age of eligibility for uh, retirement uh, for senior citizens. Right now in Social Security, the normal age of eligibility is 67, Medicare is 65. Um, Congress should align Gradually, I'm not suggesting we do this overnight, but gradually align eligibility uh, for Medicare uh, and, uh, and Social Security. We can start at the age of 67 uh, and then index the program over time for life expectancy. Uh, this would not only improve Medicare's financial condition, it would reflect actually uh, the facts on the ground. Our demographic situation has changed. Uh, life expectancy in America has improved dramatically since the 1930s, and this is especially true uh, among senior citizens, people age 65 and older. Uh, people should, if they can, should be working longer and deploy their talents, their skills, their knowledge and ability on behalf of the country and themselves and their own families. I just mentioned in this context that I want you to think back. In 2011, um, it was a brief shining moment. <laughs> Uh, there was a debate or a discussion about the budget in 2011 where Congressman Boehner and uh, President Obama were trying to figure out a way to get a budget agreement, and President Obama did agree in 2011 uh, to the idea of raising the normal age of uh, eligibility uh, for Medicare to age 67. Um, I will just mention one more thing before I close, and that is HHS officials... Um, in their budget uh, submission uh, to Congress this year point out that uh, 24 million uh, beneficiaries are now enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans. That represents 42% of the entire Medicare population. And they point out that Medicare uh, enrollment, uh, the Medicare Advantage enrollment is growing 50% uh, faster uh, than enrollment in traditional Medicare. At the same time, 48 million Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in Medicare Part D. Um, these are defined contribution programs. Uh, they are proving to be very effective, especially at providing benefits uh, to senior citizens. They emphasize, uh, they emphasize some management that makes sense. Care coordination and case management are regular features of Medicare Advantage. I think there is one area in health policy where we can say there has been, no question about it, a major success, and that's in Medicare Advantage. I would hope at some point 
that members of Congress and the White House would look at the facts on the ground and catch up with the facts on the ground and make changes to the entire Medicare program that build upon the choice and competition that characterizes Medicare Part C and Medicare Part D. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, I don't know if everybody caught this, but I did, and I appreciate Bob uh, protecting his and my uh, financial interest. Uh, when, you, when you referred to uh, having uh, higher income uh, retirees pay more, you referred to the next generation of retirees. Well, yeah. <laughs> Let me put it this way. <coughs> I, 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 uh, yeah, very good. But nevertheless, the sooner the better. Still. Sooner the better. Sooner the better. Yeah. Okay. Right. Very good. Okay. Tara, please. <laughs> Prudentially. <laughs> so I am going to talk about the other piece of Medicare. Um, so Medicare Advantage obviously has private competition, private insurers, and I'm going to talk about Part D, the prescription drug benefit um, that also is provided by private insurers, um, and specifically the need for structural reform of the benefit structure. And so... For those of you lucky ones here in the audience, there are paper copies of my paper. Pretty much everything I'm talking about is in this paper. It's called Redesigning Medicare Part D to Realign Incentives. It's also available on the American Action Forum website and I believe on the event webpage here for those of you not in the room. Um, and so I think the primary thing to consider when, when or that the easiest way to see that the Part D program really does need structural reform is really illustrated in this chart here. And I apologize that I don't have a slide, but all you really need to see is the color in the graphs. And so this chart shows the distribution of the two primary components of the Medicare subsidy for the Part D program. And so in the orange here is reinsurance, and the blue is the direct subsidy, um, direct premium subsidy. And you can see over time how dramatically the reinsurance piece has grown. The orange bar is getting larger over time. So in 2006, reinsurance accounted for about 26% of the overall subsidy of the program. In 2016, that had grown to 66%. And now it stands at about 73%. So in just 12 years, we've basically flipped the structure of the subsidy for the Part D program to where uh, the reinsurance portion now accounts for almost three-fourths rather than just one-fourth of the Part D subsidy. And that's really unsustainable. It's not the way that it was intended, and this is a dramatic imbalance that I think we need to fix. But in order to appropriately fix the problem, you need to understand what's causing that problem, right? So there's a multitude of factors. Um, you know, you have both more beneficiaries reaching catastrophic coverage, and for each of those beneficiaries that do reach catastrophic coverage, their costs are higher. And there's multiple reasons for each of those things. Um, certainly increasing drug prices is part of that, whether it's increased prices for existing drugs or higher prices for newly available drugs that have come to market over the years as, you know, medical, uh, pharmaceutical science advances, et cetera. Um, but there also are several specific policies that have been put in place over the last couple years that have largely contributed um, to this growth in the reinsurance costs. And so first we had the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, in 2010, a couple policy changes. So one, there was the introduction of the manufacturer rebates, and so drug manufacturers are now required in the coverage gap to provide 50% um, discounts. And those discounts or rebates count towards the beneficiary's so-called TROOP, so the true out-of-pocket cost, which is used to determine when the beneficiary moves through each um, phase of the benefit and ultimately when they are de have you know, been decided to reach the catastrophic coverage threshold. And so counting those rebates towards uh, TROOP means that uh -huh. they are with less actual overall spending, they're reaching the catastrophic coverage threshold more quickly. Um, secondly, they, the ACA slowed the growth, growth rate of the catastrophic coverage threshold. And so while the growth in the deductible increases, it's supposed to increase 
um, in correlation with the growing costs of the program, right? And so your deductible grows a little each year, the initial coverage limit grows a little each year, but then the catastrophic coverage threshold was, um, the growth rate for it was slowed intentionally by the ACA. And so that shortened the coverage gap. And again, similarly to with the manufacturer rebates, less overall spending is required in order for beneficiaries to, meet, to reach the catastrophic threshold. And then last year with passage of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, um, those manufacturer rebates were increased from 50% to 70%. And so now you have 95% of every dollar spent in the coverage gap, again counting towards troop, same impact, it means that beneficiaries are reaching the catastrophic phase more quickly. And so a much larger share of the overall dollars spent in Part D are in that catastrophic phase. And then finally, um, outside of policy, you know, specific actual legislation, regulation, et cetera, there also are just some built-in incentives, financial incentives, for insurers and PBMs to prefer high cost, high rebate drugs. And this is a conversation you're hearing uh, play out in all of the drug pricing hearings, et cetera, as PBMs and insurers pointing the finger at drug manufacturers and vice versa, you know, whose fault is this? Um, but the economic incentives, whether they're taking advantage of them or not, certainly are aligned to encourage the use of higher cost, high rebate drugs. And because beneficiaries pay coinsurance based on list price, the higher the price, the more coinsurance dollars, thus a higher troop, and again, reaching catastrophic coverage more quickly. So all of those factors are impacting this. Um, and MedPAC, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, seeing this trend back in 2016, noted the need for reform. And so they put forward a three-pronged approach um, to reform the program, which had lots of support, um, and so one, it would impose an out-of-pocket <coughs> cap. Um, as Bob mentioned, you know, beneficiaries don't really have true out-of-pocket financial protection, um, and so that would provide them that. Currently, beneficiaries pay 5% in catastrophic coverage, so 5% once they get there, you know, of every dollar spent until they get to start over the next year and go back through the benefit phase. Um, they also would restructure the reinsurance piece so that currently the government pay, pays 80% reinsurance in catastrophic. This, their proposal would have flipped that to where um, the government would now only pay 20%, and then the plans would pick up that 80%. Um, so the 15% that they used to pay plus the 5% from the beneficiaries, which would no longer be there because, again, there's the out-of-pocket cap. And so then they would pick up the remaining 80% government paying 20. And then also they proposed excluding manufacturer rebates from counting towards troop. And so, as I mentioned before, you know, with those counting towards it, it means that fewer dollars spent, they're reaching catastrophic. So if you exclude them from troop, then you would undo that. So again, this would provide multiple benefits. It would provide beneficiaries financial protection. It would increase the incentive for insurers to control spending because they would have high um, costs in the catastrophic phase that have a much stronger or higher liability. Um, and it would slow the number of beneficiaries reaching that coverage um, piece to begin with. However, because of the change in the BBA, that threat of the high liability in catastrophic coverage has largely been diminished. If you exclude the manufacturer rebates from counting towards troop, which are now 70%, then many, many, many fewer beneficiaries will ever actually reach catastrophic coverage. And the BBA, that extra 20% in manufacturer rebates was taken out of the insurer's liability. So insurers now only pay 5% in catastrophic, or I'm sorry, in the coverage gap. And so if beneficiaries are remaining in the coverage gap because the manufacturer rebates aren't counting towards troop, then you have insurers only paying 5% for a much larger um, duration or uh, many more dollars. And so their incentive to control spending would be greatly diminished. The liability just isn't as strong as it otherwise would be. Um, and so noticing that, we um, started looking into that and have come up with a slightly tweaked um, version to reform the Part D program, um, which MedPAC actually just um, discussed at their last, their most recent public meeting. Um, and so 
the slight differences here, we still um, propose providing the out-of-pocket cap and giving beneficiaries that financial protection. The reinsurance piece, we would do something similar. So we would um, also reduce government reinsurance liability down to 20% in the catastrophic phase. And then the plans, rather than going up to 80%, we would put their liability at 70%. And that last 10%, we would put on the drug manufacturers, moving, eliminating the coverage gap and moving the existing coverage gap rebates into the catastrophic phase. So that does a couple of things. One, you know, you have the same incentives, increased liability on the insurers, so they are going to be, um, you know, again, have that incentive to control spending. But moving the manufacturer rebates from the coverage gap into catastrophic coverage, A, it simplifies the benefit, which is just, you know, it gives you a flat 75% coinsurance um, or 25% for the beneficiary after the deductible until you get to catastrophic, and then you have your out-of-pocket cap. But the manufacturers now also, currently in the coverage gap, you know, they have to pay 50% or 70% rebates for just, you know, this amount of spending in the coverage gap. And then once the beneficiary moves on, they're not liable for any more of the cost. And so that drug could be $100,000, $200,000, and it doesn't matter. They pay no difference they just paid that fixed amount in the coverage gap. If you move the manufacturer rebates, suddenly manufacturers are on the hook for all of, you know, a certain percentage of all of the spending for the rest of the year. And so it puts a lot more incentive on the manufacturers to not have as high a cost because they're paying a fixed percentage of that for the remainder of the year. So I think it more appropriately targets um, those rebates to the actual higher cost drugs. Currently, you have um, plenty of drugs that are used in the coverage gap that are not really the most expensive, not necessarily the most deserving of having that financial penalty, penalty to the extent that any of them are. Um, and so just moving it more appropriately puts that onus on the most expensive drugs and hopefully can incentivize costs to come down a little bit. Um, so there are some obvious impacts. You know, what does that mean to beneficiaries? What does that mean uh, to the government in terms of how the subsidy is structured? So again, we're obviously trying to pull a lot of the dollars out of the reinsurance um, piece and increasing that liability on insurers would certainly be turned into an increase in premiums. So beneficiaries would see increases in premiums. Um, very similar to if you've been following the conversation on the rebate rule and having to pass rebates through at the point of sale. Similar impacts, you're going to have higher premiums, but for those beneficiaries with the most expensive drugs or taking the most expensive drugs, they should see reductions in their out-of-pocket costs. Um, and so on net overall, we think that it will be a better distribution, um, a more equal distribution of the risk. And um, those with the most, the highest costs really should see cost savings. Um, as far as the government, again, more of the subsidy dollars will be transferred back to the direct premium subsidy portion of the benefit or of the subsidy. Um, and that is the piece of the subsidy that is controlled by the risk corridors. So the reinsurance piece, you get 80% of every dollar spent in reinsurance regardless, but in the basic benefit of the program, the portion that covers everything up to, um, and then including just your assumed 15% in catastrophic. That's all contained within the risk corridor. And so that means that the government um, shares your, if you estimate that your bid is, if you estimate your costs are going to be lower than they actually are and your costs are higher, then the government shares some of that excess cost with you with the insurer and vice versa. If you estimate your costs are going to be higher and you get more subsidy than you would have, you have to pay some of that back, but not all of it. And we've seen evidence of plans kind of overbidding their basic benefit and they get to save up to 5%, you know, half of their, um, the extra subsidy that they get. And so I think bringing more of the dollars within the confines of the risk corridor um, will help keep the overall subsidy from being higher than it should be. Okay, thanks. Uh, you know, <clears throat> this uh, uh, presentation uh, reminds us just how complicated government programs can be. 
uh, and just how wrong the words are that we use with government programs. True out-of-pocket cost? You mean untrue out-of-pocket cost. <laughs> right. Um, the, uh, uh, but it all, but also illustrates the, the, the point that um, uh, the private sector, the health sector, responds to government uh, uh, price incentives, responds to the financial incentives. So, so it's not a coincidence that we saw, although you couldn't see the, the chart, uh, it, it isn't a coincidence that we're seeing more and more spending in Part <coughs> D uh, going into this uh, catastrophic zone where uh, uh, so-called reinsurance is paid. Reinsurance is essentially uh, uh, a subsidy tied to the cost of the drug. That's the wrong incentive. The, the more basic subsidy below that level is actually a capitated s subsidy. So what we have is kind of a combination of, of two parts of the program. We have, in essence, something like th the Medicare Advantage subsidy below that catastrophic level, and then we have fee-for-service above that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, bring, in the, uh, bring in the psychiatrist to solve this uh, policy schizophrenia. Uh, and with that... Speaking of schizophrenia... <laughs> um, so thank you, Joe, I think, for inviting me to participate today and for having this event every year. And thanks especially to Paul and his team for doing such a great job every year helping out with the trustees report. Um, I echo uh, Bob's comments about how valuable the report is every year. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a bit. So as, as you all know, that there, there are many proposals out there that would expand access to public insurance programs and that they would be based in whole or in part on Medicare. I'm gonna to try to sort out uh, some of the issues behind some of these programs and focus on three approaches that are based on Medicare, even though in some cases it's kind of a misnomer. So I'm gonna look at including a public option in the Affordable Care Act insurance exchanges, uh, creating a Medicare buy-in and expanding Medicare to all. Now regardless of what proposal we're talking about here, the details really matter. How the design features are specified will impact access to insurance as well as access to care itself, uh, premiums and out-of-pocket costs, the viability of the expansion of the public program, as well as the viability for any remaining health insurance markets, such as the individual market, and the group market. And before I get to those, those three different types of proposals, I just want to clarify that I am not opposing or supporting any of these proposals. What I'm trying to do is just highlight some of the key points. So turning first to including a public option in the exchanges. This is where the misnomer comes into effect, because you'll hear these referred to a lot as Medicare buy-in proposals. Uh, but really, they would be following, all, it would just be a government plan that follows all the Affordable Care Act rules. The difference between that public government plan and the private plans is that that public plan provider payment rates would be based on Medicare or, or some version of Medicare. So Medicare bump up, say 125% of Medicare payment rates. But everything else would be the same. The public plan would follow um, all the ACA essential health benefit rules, the actuarial value tiers, it would um, be part of the single risk pool. Premiums would be set so that they would cover all claims and expenses. And so in that way, this, these, this would not, because it's really not Medicare, um, and because the cost would, the premiums would be set to cover all the costs, it would not affect the Medicare program, current Medicare beneficiaries, or the Medicare trust funds. So looking next at creating a Medicare buy-in. So this would allow people younger than age 65 to purchase Medicare coverage. And typically, a lot of these plans would, would allow buy-ins to start at, for older adults, say age 50 or 55 up to age 64. But some plans would allow buy-ins for, for everyone, regardless of age. Uh, premiums would be set to be self-supporting. So in other words, again, they would be set so that they would cover all claims and expenses. And in this way, the program, a, a buy-in program, would not, 
be affecting current Medicare beneficiaries or the trust funds. That said, many design issues would affect how attractive these plans would be to potential enrollees and would have implications for enrollees and current market options. So these design features include eligibility. So aside from age, are there any other eligibility requirements? And would employers, for instance, be allowed to purchase coverage for their workers? Um, second, what would the benefits be? Would the benefit package be based on the current Medicare back package, the part A, B, and D? Um, that might make sense if eligibility is limited to, to really the older adults getting close to age 65. That would keep the benefits more consistent and equitable between the buy-in population and the current eligible population. However, the lower the eligibility age gets for the buy-in, it might make more sense to consider basing benefits more closely on the Affordable Care Act essential health benefit requirements or what's typically offered under employer plans. Another question is whether uh, the Affordable Care Act cost-sharing subsidies would be allowed to be used toward the buy-in plan, and if so, how would that work? I think some, some proposals um, consider this, but I think it'd be pr pretty complicated to implement. Another question is how would premiums be set? Even though premiums would be set in the aggregate to cover all of claims and expenses, how would those premiums vary by enrollee? Would there be a uniform national premium that everyone would pay, or would the premium vary by factors such as the enrollee age, the geographic location, and income? And in addition, would ACA premium subsidies be allowed to be used toward the buy-in plan? So the answers to the, to the benefit questions and the premium questions in particular can, attract how, can affect how attractive the buy-in plan is and can affect whether that plan would be subject to adverse selection. So in other words, would, would sicker people be more likely to be the ones that, that enroll in the plan? In addition, how the buy-in plan design features compared to the features in ACA plans and employer plans can affect selection between those plans. So for instance, if the buy-in plan is more attractive to sicker people, it could pull um, some of the people away from those other plans into, into the buy-in, and what would happen is that would drive those premiums up. It could happen the other way. Again, design, it really depends on how these features are designed. It could happen the other way that the Medicare program, the buy-in, could attract healthy people and pull those away, which could drive up premiums in the already existing markets. So in addition to these uh, questions, there are some other uh, features that would need to be considered and designed for a buy-in plan. And these include what would provider payment rates be? Again, would they be designed on, um, set at Medicare rates? Would there be a bump up? How would that work? Also, would Medicare Advantage plans be available? Um, and if so, how would the bidding process work? Would MA sponsors be required to cover the buy-in population? Or could they pick and choose whether they wanted to, to cover the current eligible population and or the buy-in population? And also, would supplemental coverage, such as Medigap coverage, uh, be available? And if so, what rules would apply to that? So turning next to Medicare for All, which would expand Medicare coverage to everyone. Um, now generally, having a public plan option in the ACA exchanges or having a Medicare buy-in would make that coverage optional. Um, as a result, those plans could be subject to adverse selection. Now, in contrast, having a Medicare for all uh, option or scenario, that would make Medicare really the only game in town for people. It would not be optional. It would be what people would enroll in. Now, that, on one hand, would eliminate uh, the adverse selection concerns. On the other hand, it would reduce or eliminate choice and could cause some disruption for, for people who have to move from their current coverage to Medicare coverage. So there are, are trade-offs between choice and adverse selection. So strictly speaking, 
Medicare for All would extend current Medicare program to everyone. But as you know, the current Medicare for All proposals would go farther than this. They would uh, make coverage more comprehensive by including more benefits, and they would reduce and sometimes eliminate patient cost sharing. So it would really be a new program that would affect not just new enrollees, but also current enrollees. And of course, it could have a significant, or it would have a significant effect on the trust funds as the program would need more financing. Now some, um, at least some of that, or, or much of that new spending could be offset by reduced spending in, in the current coverage sources for people for both private and public plans. Now as with other approaches that would expand uh, access to, to public plans, the implications of a Medicare for All proposal really depend on how the design features are specified. Uh, so as with a buy-in program, questions include what benefits would be covered and what, what would the cost sharing requirements be? Would Medicare Advantage plans be available? Would supplemental plans such as Medigap be, be available? And would Medicaid uh, still be around to cover some of the costs of the low-income beneficiaries? What, how would provider payment rates be set? Um, and how would the program be financed? And if there are premiums, how would they be set? And last but not least, how would the transition to the Medicare for All from the current system be structured? So I'll leave it there and happy to take questions. Okay, well, uh, Bernie Sanders doesn't appear to be in the room, so I don't think he's gonna be able to ask you any questions. Um, but uh, actually, I wanted to clar clarify something before we get to the general discussion. I thought I heard you say, in the context of a buy-in, that it would be that it might be conceivable that a buy-in would attract would have favorable selection would attract healthy people, and if it's following the ACA rules, what did you have in mind there? No, no, no. For the buy-in, it's not necessarily following the ACA rules. I'm talking about the, the, when I was saying the plan would follow ACA rules. That's if you have a public option in the Affordable Care Act exchange, which would almost by definition mean it would have to follow the ACA rules. Um, for the buy-in plan, that's, it's not clear what those rules so, would be. So, so, so those so could how be different. So the, the oh, issue okay. is how would the rules for the buy-in plan oh, oh, compare oh, okay. to the ACA rules? And if they're different, that could affect selection one way or the other. Yeah, okay, great. But uh, uh, I'd, I'd like a, a clearer answer to the question, how do you avoid uh, sick people? In general, given given that you're going uh, given that you're going to well, unless you're going to break the the uh, rules protecting people with pre-existing conditions, for example, or unless you're going to uh, 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 cut out some benefits, that's basically it, right? Well, how you? I guess the question is: Are you talking about adverse selection in general? Or are you talking about adverse selection for the, the buy-in plan as compared to the other options that that person faces? Well, so I think that's I, the same question. Anyway, no, I don't, oh, okay. I think, I, think the, I, think the, I think the point, I think, I, so I'll make a, a point rather than uh, uh, torture I'm, a Tory. No, so I'm, let, me, let me answer okay, that. Right. So <laughs> I think you can reduce... Uh, adverse selection in the buy-in plan, for instance, by you know having that be subsidized or or just making that attractive some in some way. But the the question is if that plan has attracts healthy people, is it taking those healthy people away from current existing coverage? Then that then that creates adverse selection in those other markets. So that's. Okay, so, 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 one, so one approach would be to have a rule that says that if you currently have coverage somewhere else, you can't get the buy-in. That, that might do it. Because what you're basically saying is that you want to extract people who are not going to uh, draw, uh, are not going to end up uh, creating a worse risk uh, selection for uh, uh, plans other than the other than the buy-in plan. I, this is a very complicated area, and let me make a final make make a, a key point here, which is that uh, what's going to kill this idea is, of course, CBO. 
uh, we can count on CBO to give this a very, very bad score. Uh, and um, so, uh, it, you know, the, the fine points are, are very important, but if you're thinking about uh, a, uh, either a full Medicare for all type plan, uh, uh, complete with the Class Act uh, revisited, uh, or if you're thinking about, about a buy-in, I think CBO is almost certainly going to uh, estimate uh, severe adverse uh, uh, selection, uh, absolutely not relative to something else. And that's what's, that's what's going to drive the, the budget score. And ultimately, if it ever got that far, which I don't think it will, uh, that's uh, what would uh, basically put Democrats in the same position, position Republicans were uh, two years ago. Um, <clears throat> so with that, uh, let's have a little bit of discussion. And uh, I'd actually like to kick it off by uh, uh, tormenting Bob a little bit about the funding trigger. Um, <laughs> I think it's fair to say that the president's budget is something like the administration's response. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, if that was the case, though, he should say so. That's all. Yeah. I mean, the, I, the, uh, the president's budget is not insignificant. Uh, $811 billion over 10 years and an extension of the life of the trust fund by about eight years, uh, HI trust fund. It's, that's, not, that's not anything to sneeze at. And the other thing is, is that, uh, frankly, a lot of what he is proposing is, on the, on the surface anyway, uh, it's not particularly controversial. A lot of this is actually really good, solid, common sense recommendations. And I think the most outstanding recommendation is the idea of some is, a, is site neutrality <clears throat> uh, for Medicare payment. And that, as I, as I mentioned, I think will have a very, very positive effect on the ground. You and I both know, serving in, in, in Maryland, uh, you know, my service on the health care commission and, and yours, you know, with the hospital uh, rate setting commission, we know that we have very, very difficult problems right now with the consolidation of health care delivery in large hospital systems. If Medicare makes these changes, uh, Medicare's influence on the general commercial market is so powerful, really, that it will start to drive other, other uh, competitive forces, which could actually lower cost and improve, I think, the quality of care. Uh, yes, I, well. I mean, but the point, the point is uh, the Trump administration is making this case. I'm under no illusions about whether or not uh, the Congress will actually pick up the legislative <laughs> proposals and pass them. I, given the polarized environment in which we live right now, it's uh, it's hard to imagine that. But the truth of the matter is is that they are very very solid proposals, specifically with regard to the site neutrality proposals. Yeah, I would just like to echo that comment and put my support as well behind um, imposing site neutral payment reform. I think that would really do a lot, like you said, to. Um, stop the consolidation in the markets that really is leading to increased costs um, and no seeming benefits in quality. And so I think that would be an excellent proposal to move forward on. So uh, actually in that regard, uh, do you see uh, uh, any sign of interest on the part of the administration or Congress for that matter in uh, either your version of restructuring Part D to rationalize that program or, or MedPAC's uh, version. I mean, MedPAC's, and, and you've been talking about this for at least two years. MedPAC's been talking about it probably for a little bit longer. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's a known defect. Is there is there interest on the Hill? Is there interest in the administration? Yeah, I think there's growing interest. Um, I put this paper out in August last year, and suddenly in the last couple months, it has started to gain a lot of traction. Um, I've been speaking with folks on the Hill about it. Um, as I mentioned, MedPAC at their meeting just a few weeks ago, their most recent public meeting, um, they actually discussed this idea and kind of you know, alluded to the fact that their proposals from 2016 are maybe no longer exactly the best way to move forward. Um, and my paper specifically is, is mentioned as a potential way um, to move forward. And where exactly those numbers fall, the percentages in the catastrophic phase, you know, how much should the government have, how much should insurers have, and the drug manufacturers, um, you know, that's something that is, 
being discussed, you know, obviously, depending on where you put it, the impacts will be different. Um, and so that is an important consideration of where exactly those numbers should fall. But at least conceptually, um, there seems to be recognition of um, the sense that this proposal um, seems to make in, in realigning those incentives. So uh, Paul, I had, had a question about uh, drugs as well um, uh, for you. Uh, you mentioned in one of your slides about slide maybe, hmm, maybe about slide 19, I'm not sure. Uh, but you show that uh, in this slide, uh, comparing the 2018 report to the 2019 report. In 2018, the Part D uh, spending as a percentage of GDP in 2090 was, uh, you're estimating 1.15%, and it drops down to 1.05%, and even though those seem like small numbers, they're, they're not small numbers. They're, they're, that's a significant change. And I was just uh, wondering, uh, where you saw the reduction? Do you see it in terms of, because uh, you and you also mentioned that higher rebates. So I guess the, I guess my question is, uh, how do you see the rebates, the lo the higher rebates, translating into program savings? And are you are we anticipating uh, stronger savings for uh, patients at the pharmacy counter, or are we seeing uh, stronger savings for everybody who signs up a Part D plan because uh, uh, premiums drop a bit. So, so yes, as, as I mentioned during uh, the presentation, that the exp the reduction in the long range uh, Part D spending was attributable to two things. One was slightly slower uh, trend growth, um, but also a higher expectation for uh, manufacturer rebates that are uh, contributing to re reduce the cost of the program, um, reduce the cost of program spending, um, and the way that it does that is. The, can get into the minutia of it, but effectively, the more that um, rebate dollars are, manufacturer rebate dollars are entering the system, the lower program spending is, the lower premium spending is. And so it does get to beneficiaries um, in the form of reduced premium payments most directly. Um, there's been okay. so, the administration. So you're saying the major, the, uh, more than 50% probably through reduced premium payments? Uh, reduced premium payments and fe reduced federal subsidies. Yeah. Um, there has been, you know, the administration did uh, uh, release a proposed rule that would uh, change the treatment of rebates uh, within the program, um, and that would shift uh, the effects of those rebates uh, from reducing premiums to reducing uh, out-of-pocket costs in, in, instead. And so if that rule gets finalized, that would be a, a pretty transformational change in terms of the incentives of the program. Uh, and it would, if I remember your report, uh, it would substantially increase uh, program spending. And I think primarily because when the when the premiums go up, uh, the taxpayers pay roughly 75%. Uh, yes, we have estimated that that rule would increase costs, um, uh, increase premiums, um, and reduce beneficiary out-of-pocket spending. Okay, well, uh, we might have time for a couple of questions, if anybody had one. Uh, wait, wait uh, please identify yourself. And uh, as I always say, uh, you know, make your statement uh, in the form of a question. <laughs> Paul Heldman from Heldman Simpson Partners. Following on your question, Joe, to Paul and maybe Tara and others would want to weigh in on this. And I think you make, it's trustees report numbers show and it shows in your presentation that um, they seem to cast doubt on the potential of the Part D rebate rule actually producing savings. And I think one thing that you didn't mention, Joe, is that I believe in the proposed rule, you said that actually the discounts would be uh, would narrow, and so drug costs would go up. And so I guess I'd, what I'd like you to do is maybe address in do more detail why your assumptions differ from those who believe the rebate rule will drive down um, drug prices and costs to Part D? So uh, I, I will respond to the question, but I will point out that to talk about the trustees report uh, and uh, current law approach. And so we're going to try to emphasize that. Um, uh, there's, there's a number of assumptions that go into the program, uh, program costs, and I'll talk about some of the incentives under the uh, current law dynamic, and then I'll uh, hopefully answer the question as to how we looked at it uh, when estimating the impact of the, of the drug uh, rebate uh, rule, uh, proposed rule. Um, there is currently an incentive uh, 
four plans, and I think Tara uh, did a nice job uh, explaining some of these incentives, um, that there is uh, a, a benefit to plans and manufacturers effectively um, to have higher cost drugs um, with larger rebates. That effectively um, gets beneficiaries through the uh, benefit phases faster um, and ultimately gets uh, more federal dollars in the form of reinsurance uh, contributions. And also those rebates do uh, help reduce uh, premiums on a dollar for dollar basis. To the extent that that incentive were f was flipped, um, you know, so the natural state of that incentive would be to have slightly higher price cost growth for prescription drugs as well as faster rebate cost growth, um, no, rebate growth. Um, to the extent that that incentive was removed, um, that was, that, that's the effect that we effectively removed when we did the pricing. Um, so we effectively unwound some of that excess price cost growth um, that is tied directly to the increases in the rebate cost growth. So uh, again, trying to focus on uh, the current law, but, but that's effectively the incentives under the current law. Um, that would be changed uh, if the rebate rule were to be finalized. No. So you're, you're they can add. Correct. Um, the, the question is, uh, we are assuming that prices go up, and prices, yes, uh, prices go up. Um, I think that's true throughout time. Um, the, the the issue is is that um, the issue is that the incentives are that there would be additional price increases for these drugs tied with additional rebates that net advantage uh, effectively the manufacturers and uh, the plan sponsors um, in getting beneficiaries through the benefit quicker um, and, and therefore getting to the, the reinsurance faster. If that incentive was, was changed, then that additional pressure um, for additional increases on the price side and additional uh, increases on the rebate side um, would be eliminated. I'm afraid, I'm afraid we'll have to take this up uh, uh, after, after we're through. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel for an excellent discussion.